We're going to look this evening at the profession of Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And as we come into this passage, we should note that it is after more than two years with his disciples that Jesus begins to ask these two very important questions that we are going to look at. The master now turns to his twelve and he asks them, who do men say that I am? Not the scribes and the Pharisees, but the common man. Not the religious rulers, but the people on the street. Who do they say that I am? What is the word on the street about me? I have been going around teaching and preaching. I have been doing many mighty works and miracles. What has this caused to stir in the hearts of men? What have you heard? Now, Jesus isn't implying that he's not sure. He doesn't know. He hasn't heard. But he wants his disciples to think about what they have heard. And then the second question we'll notice is, okay, so who do you say that I am? I ask you first, what have you been hearing about me? But I ask you second, what do you think about me? He asks what they have heard publicly. He asks what they believe personally. And to the first question, as we will see, the disciples offer several responses. There are many different things being said by many different people. To the second question, Peter steps forward with an insightful and spirit-filled profession. And I believe it seems reasonable to assume, by the way, as we note this, even though Peter gets the publicity for the profession, I think it is reasonable to assume that Peter did not speak for himself alone, but rather as the mouthpiece for all of the disciples. And I would accept and exclude Judas Iscariot. We know from the rest of Scripture that he was not a true follower of the Christ. So Peter gets up, he steps forward, and he speaks, I believe, on behalf of the rest of his brothers. Now, remember, as we have gone through these several chapters already, the disciples were told by John the Baptist that Jesus was indeed the long-awaited Messiah. He was preparing the way for Messiah, and when Jesus came to be baptized, Remember, some of Jesus' disciples at first were some of John's disciples. And so he pointed them to him. It's time for you now to follow Christ, to follow Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. The disciples together heard the preaching of Jesus, which astonished not only the crowds, but I'm sure themselves as well. The disciples together witnessed the power of Jesus over the storm. Remember the storm where Jesus is asleep in the boat? Master, don't you care that we're perishing? They wake him up and he stills the storm. And we are told after that 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 really traumatized them. To see Jesus, this man that they had begun to follow, literally speak to nature and for the natural forces to heed and obey his word, this actually scared the disciples. And they spoke amongst themselves. Who could this man be? Who is this man that we are following? The disciples together, recall, worshipped Jesus after he walked on the water. The disciples together witnessed his miracles, his mighty works. And the disciples, no doubt together, believed him to be the Christ. But in this passage, Peter is the one who steps forward. It is Peter who stands up, who opens his mouth, and actually makes this incredible profession that Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus is the Son of the living God. So let's read this brief passage, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, 
and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then I find this the most fascinating part of the whole passage. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. How about that? To have this incredible profession, to have Jesus call you blessed for speaking it forth, and then after he blesses you saying, now shh, don't tell anybody <laughs> how interesting Jesus is in his ministry. So number one, as we'll look into this brief text, number one, the public opinion of Jesus, the public perception of Jesus. Number two, the spiritual revelation of Jesus. And number three, the rock and the keys of the kingdom. So the public opinion. Jesus speaks of himself, you'll notice in this passage, as the Son of Man. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I am the Son of Man. What do people think about me as the Son of Man? Now remember, this is an assertion of his own identity as Messiah. You can go back to Jan Daniel chapter 7 where the Son of Man is prophesied. And it is a title of Messiahship. This is not a title to be taken to oneself, to oneself lightly. It's one thing to say we are all sons of men or you are a son of man. That's a reasonable title for any child of Adam. But to say that I am the Son of Man, that I am the distinct and set apart Son of Man, this is a messianic title. And this is a title brought out of Daniel chapter 7, out from the prophets, out from the scriptures. This was a well-known title. Daniel chapter 7 wasn't obscure to the Jews of Jesus' time. And Jesus' followers, for the most part, you know, Matthew and a couple others perhaps excluded, but for the most part, these were religious men. Well, we see that Matthew had been caught up in the ways of the world. He'd become a tax collector, and his circle of friends and his environment were sinners, not religious people. But I should imagine that Matthew, as a child of Israel, grew up and was taught all of these things. He may have strayed from it as an adult, but as children, these were common things to be taught. The messianic expectation at the time of Christ was at its zenith. People were familiar with the messianic scriptures. It was a popular uh, subject of debate. What do you think about Messiah? Who will Messiah be? What will he be like when he comes? So Jesus says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, Am. He asserts his own identity as Messiah and says, what are people saying about me? Are they believing that I am the Messiah, the Christ? And in case perhaps it has gone over your head or I haven't made it clear, Messiah and Christ are the same terms. Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek. To be Messiah is to be the Christ and vice versa. Jesus asks about his public perception. What are people saying about me? This is a question that is important for every man to answer. Indeed, many get this answer wrong, and in fact, there are too many who do not even consider the question, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is Jesus Christ? Does he have any bearing on your life? Does he have any authority over you? Should he have any authority over you? Who do men say that I am? Is it, it is a question that was asked then, and it has continued to be asked even in our day. And the answer to this question 
Each individual's answer to this question is the most important answer they will ever give on this earth and in the world to come. Here in this realm and at the gates of heaven, the answer to this question will determine your eternal destiny. The disciples give several answers to this. Well, I've heard some say you're John the Baptist. Remember Herod? He thought that Jesus was John the Baptist come back from the dead after he had beheaded him. Elijah. Some think that you're that great prophet, Elijah, who was taken up in a whirlwind at the cross. Perhaps as you remember the story of Calvary, we will hear this. He calls out for Elijah. Jeremiah. Jesus, like Jeremiah, was a prophet of the people. He resisted the rich. He resisted the rulers. Jesus, like Jeremiah, was full of compassion, often moved to help the people, to minister to the people. Sometimes to minister to their sickness and disease and affliction of demons. And other times, like we saw in our previous study, well, they're just hungry and I want to feed them. I want to take care of them. They've been following me. They don't have anything to eat. Jesus was often moved with compassion. So perhaps Jesus is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the, the, the prophet of, of emotion, the prophet of the people. Or some of those prophets, one of those prophets. He must be one of the prophets come back to us. And in, in other places in the New Testament, they ascribe him to be the prophet spoken of by Moses. In Moses' preaching in the book of Deuteronomy, he claimed that there would be a prophet that would rise up and lead the people. And pe the people expected that that prophet would be Messiah. Messianic and mysterious. A prophet with the power of Moses. Now, perhaps you wonder, as I do, why they would imagine that Jesus was a prophet come back from the dead. The Jews did not believe in reincarnation. And John the Baptist and Jesus lived together. John baptized Jesus. So why would the Jews or why would Herod or why would anybody think, oh, well, Jesus is John the Baptist come back from the dead. Well, how could that be when John the Baptist baptized Jesus? They were there at the same time. They did not believe in reincarnation, but they did believe in the spirit and power of a prophet. Remember, Jesus spoke of John the Baptist and said, if you can receive it, he is Elijah who has come. He is come in the spirit and power of Elijah. They believed in the mantle of a prophet that could be passed from one man to the next, just as the mantle of Elijah fell upon Elisha. So they aren't speaking of reincarnation. What they are speaking of is the spirit and power, the mantle of a prophet being passed on and coming upon Jesus Christ. So these were the common answers that people would give. What do you think about Jesus? Is he the Christ? What do you think about Jesus? Is, the son of, is he the son of man? Who do you think he is? And these were the answers that were common in the towns and villages and cities where Jesus had gone through, where he had spoken, where he had healed people. So number two, after looking at his public perception, notice the spiritual revelation of Jesus that we see next in Peter's confession. As Jesus says, okay, well, who do you, my disciples, those closest to me, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps forward, I'm sure with the approval of the others, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one of God. You are the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to this profession and he says, blessed are you. Every man, woman, and child who professes Jesus to be the Christ, Jesus to be the Son of the living God, who puts their faith in him, who believes in him, they are blessed. We are blessed with believing Peter. You see, every man and woman and child must answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is he 
in truth? Who is he really? Is he the Christ? Is he the promised one to come? Is he the one that the scriptures spoke about? Or is he something else? And when we say he's something else, what we are saying is he is something less. Jesus proclaimed himself to be the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. And yet, in light of all of his preaching, in light of all of his mighty works and miracles, well, maybe he's John the Baptist come back from the dead. Or even in our day, oh, he's just a, a good prophet. Yes, he has the spirit and power of a prophet. Jesus was such a good teacher. We should live up to his moral teaching. But the truth of the matter is, and the only answer that receives the blessing of Jesus, the blessing of God, is that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the coming one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist said, the Son of the living God. Not an angel, as the pastor was speaking of uh, from Hebrews, the last few studies on Sunday morning. Not, not an angel, not something lower than God, but God in the flesh, the Son of the living God, the only begotten of God, as John tells us. And so Jesus says, blessed are you. Now, why are you blessed when, like Peter, you profess that Jesus is the Christ? Why was Peter blessed because of this profession? Because it is the evidence that the Father has revealed this to you. It's only a few pages back in chapter 11. Perhaps we should remember what Jesus said about the revelation of the Son by the Father. In chapter 11, towards the end of the chapter, in verse 25, Jesus, after he had rebuked the unbelievers, he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things, the, the things of the gospel, from the wise and the prudent. You could read the arrogant, <laughs> the prideful. You have hidden it from them and have revealed them to babes, to the simple, to the innocent. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and he to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And then he goes on with that famous passage, Come to me. Come to me. So notice, Jesus had spoken of how the Father reveals the hidden things to those whom he chooses. Peter, those disciples back then, those in the early church who believed the same profession, those in the church today, those through the ages of the church who have believed the same thing, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. We are blessed today as Peter was back then because it is evidence of the Spirit's work in our life. It is evidence that the Father has revealed the Son to us and that we are His. This is spiritually revealed truth. The natural man does not comprehend it. The natural man looks for some sort of rationale, some sort of reasonable answer outside of the truth. I, I can't believe that. And so I will ascribe something else to him. A good teacher, a good prophet, a mighty prophet. Yes, they might even agree that sure, he did miracles. But I don't want to hear that he's the Christ. I don't want to hear that he has authority over all. I don't want to hear that I must submit and bow the knee to him. I don't want to hear that I should repent of my sins. Well, you know, maybe he's like Jeremiah. He, he's a great and wonderful prophet, a prophet of the people, a prophet full of compassion. Oh, Jesus loves me. He would never judge me. And so we excuse the truth and we exchange the truth for the lie. The natural man does not comprehend these things. Over and over and over again does the New Testament tell this to us. Jesus came to his own, and his own calls Jesus Lord, except by the Spirit. Think about that. Nobody calls Jesus Lord except by the Spirit. If you have come to Jesus, and if you have bowed before him, submitted to him, 
repented of your sins and believed in him it is because the spirit has moved upon your heart the spirit has brought conviction to you the spirit has testified of the son to you the spirit has bore witness of Jesus Christ to you and has brought you to your knees has conquered your hardened heart has bringing brought you out of darkness into as Peter would say later in his letter into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ and so it is a great blessing anytime somebody makes this profession it is to know that they are blessed of the Lord for they have seen the light the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ now notice what Jesus says uh, our third point the rock and the keys notice what Jesus says here following Peter's confession and following that it has not been revealed to him through human means flesh and blood but revealed to him by the Father who is in heaven notice what he goes on to say in verse 18 and 19 and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it so a couple of things here that we must note first of all there's a play on words there's sort of a, a pun that the Lord Jesus employs here I say to you that you are Peter and the Greek name is a name that means a rock a stone and then he says and on this rock and just in in the Greek it's it's very similar words here okay you are Petros and upon this Petra I will build my church so that there's a play on words going here Simon you are Peter Simon you are the rock Simon you are solid amongst your brothers Simon you have spoken the solid truth of the gospel that I am the Christ that I am the son of the living God and upon this rock-solid profession upon the rock-solid truth that you have spoken that is the foundation upon which I'm going to build my church Jesus was speaking to these men specifically the 11 they would be joined by a 12th in Matthias later after the death of Judas these were the men who would be the foundation of the church the Apostles doctrine would be the truth upon which the church would rest and believe and be built upon these men were learning the truth of Jesus Christ so that they could preach it throughout the world yes Jesus would tell them here don't tell anybody about this right now but eventually he would say now go out into all the world and let everybody know there was a time for this and that time would eventually come and so Jesus speaks to them about this this rock-solid truth that Peter has professed this is the great truth upon which the church will be built that Jesus of Nazareth was more than a man he was the son of man that Jesus is the Christ the Messiah the Holy One of God that Jesus is the Son of the Living God and number two notice he says I will build my church now we use this word so commonly we may not have noticed that this is the first time in the New Testament that we actually see the word employed here in the Gospel of Matthew it is the first time that it has been used and I think it is important to note that this word here church or ecclesia this was a very common word in that day you see the synagogues were the assembly places they were the gathering places the meeting places for religious Jewish worship and they were commonly referred to as uh, well for instance the congregation of, of, of the Jews um, God's people in the translation of their scriptures in the translation of the Old Testament into Greek when you when you read maybe in, in our English translation the congregation uh, you know Moses led the congregation of Israel through the wilderness well the word over and over and over again employed is the word ecclesia it's the word assembly it's the word here church so Jesus was not coining a new term 
But he was using the same term that going back to the days of Moses had always been used to refer to the assembly of God's people. So Jesus says, I am going to build my assembly, my congregation, my church. What has been from the beginning, God working with his people, that is going to now culminate in the assembly of the people of Christ. He's the culmination of all that the prophets had foretold. Jesus now is saying, the people of God will be my people. They will be distinct as followers of me. I will build my church, my assembly, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So, the rock of revelation is the truth of Christ and who he is and what he has done for us. The rock of revelation is the power of his spirit to open blind eyes, to open deaf ears, to change hardened hearts, and to raise those who are spiritually dead into spiritual life. And it's a rock of security. My assembly, my people, the people of God who are gathered together in my name, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The, the gates of, of hell, the, the gates of darkness, as, as the enemy spiritual forces come against the church, come against my people, come against the assembly of God, yes, they will attack, but they will never conquer. Yes, they will assail the church, but they will never prevail over the church. And you can go through the history of the church, and it has seen dark days. The assembly of God's people under the banner of Christ have been attacked by the powers of Satan. And God's people, the people of Christ, have been persecuted throughout the ages. We noted last week that even in our day, the persecution of Christians is greater than at any time in the history of the church. We look back and we see the horrors of the things that the empire of Rome did to the church, the atrocities that were committed upon the people of God who followed Christ, and it pales in comparison to the numbers that we are seeing today of those who are being persecuted and executed for the name of Christ. So the church has seen dark days, and the church is experiencing dark days even in our time. And yet, the church has never been conquered. The light has never been snuffed. The darkness has encroached about it, and yet the light remains to shine ever more brightly. The Lord Jesus has fulfilled his promise. And we must understand that the promise is never that your life will be easy but that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's the promise. So we should not be surprised when trials come our way or when temptations come our way. But we must understand he has made the way of escape. The problem is we don't always prefer his way of escape. If we are standing before the axe or the sword, the guillotine or the stake, are we willing to accept that his way of escape might be death? Are we willing to accept that for the Lord, life in heaven is far more valuable than life on earth? See, we hold on to the earthly life, and sometimes we don't like the way of escape to be death. Now, fortunately, none of us here will probably ever have to face that way of escape, but many have. Many have stood there with their children as family members one by one have been devoured by beast or executed by sword. Fathers have had to watch their children be executed before them. Children have had to watch their parents be executed in front of them. Sometimes the way of escape is not easy. I think it's a great wickedness and a great disservice that pastors in our country do when they try to insist that, oh, you know, God's going to take care of you in a very comfortable way. Oh, if you just look around, he has a, a convenient way of escape that's going to take you out of that trial. And the truth of the matter is, the way of escape, at least from the way I look at Scripture, seems to always be right through the middle of the trial. 
seems to be right through the middle of the storm. And I think to preach that, oh, you know, God's just always going to remove the problem. God's always going to solve the problem. Well, his solution is often that we be witnesses in the problem. And this is so contrary to the American gospel that we have swallowed hook, line, and sinker so often. And we wonder why our, our Christianity is fat and bloated rather than lean and strong. And so he gives us the promise of security that his church will ever march forward. His assembly will ever keep going, no matter what happens to it, no matter what goes on with it. And Jesus has already mentioned, hey, there's going to be some tears growing up in the middle of it. It's going to be hurt from the inside. It's going to be attacked from within, not just from without. But the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. And so he says also, I give you the keys in verse 19, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How incredible that Jesus would speak to his disciples, and I think even in our day to us who call him Lord, that he would give authority to act in his name. And not just authority to act in his name, but also confidence that he stands behind us. That what we do, he's going to affirm. Now, obviously, this isn't carte blanche. It must be according to his word. It must be according to his will. It must be with great prayer that we act in his name. The great shame of the church has often been that we proclaim things or we do things in the name of Christ that are so far outside of Scripture. How could anybody ever expect that Christ would affirm it or approve of it? But when we act in his name and when we do so honorably and in truth, and biblically and scripturally when we stand upon scripture and minister in the name of Christ when we stand upon his word and we act in Christ's name we can be confident that we have that authority to do so and we can be confident that Christ stands behind our words and our message as long as we're preaching his words he'll stand behind our message he gives us the keys of the kingdom and in conclusion, I might as well just note here this strange verse, verse 20, where he says, Now don't tell anybody what we have been talking about here, that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't tell anyone about me. I love this. There's, there's a lesson here. Jesus was content to rely upon the Father's timeline. Jesus was content to be received by those whom the Spirit would open their eyes. Jesus did not need fame or men's praise or men's approval. He was content to wait for the Father's will and the Father's time and for the Spirit's working. He wasn't in a rush. He wasn't in a hurry. Just, just ask his dearest friends, Mary and Martha, dearest friends of Christ, Lazarus is sick, please come quickly. And he doesn't move. He doesn't budge for days. Finally, he shows up four days after Lazarus has died. Jesus wasn't in a rush then. He's not in a rush now. How often do we read in the scripture, wait upon the Lord? So should it surprise us that when the Son of God came down, he waited upon his Father. And that he would pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. I'm content for your will to be done. You see, eventually his disciples would preach to the whole world, as we mentioned earlier. But this was not that time. There would be the appropriate time. After his death, burial, and resurrection, after he would take those 40 days or so to teach his disciples and speak to his disciples and open up the scriptures to his disciples, once they were ready, he would then commission them to preach to the whole world. Go out and proclaim the gospel but this was not that time. Patience. So often in Scripture, patience is the lesson being taught. So often in Scripture, wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. And I've often said, what does it mean to wait upon the Lord? Well, to me, I like the idea of, of a waiter or a waitress. There they are. You're sitting, you're having your meal, you're enjoying uh, your time in this restaurant, your favorite restaurant, and you love that there's somebody looking out 
Uh, does Pastor Terry need more coffee? Oh, let me take care of that. Oh, does Ella need another Coke? Let me take care of that. Uh, is there some, something else that, needs, that there is needed at this table? See, they're, they're waiting on you. Waiting, I think so often we think is very passive. I'm just, just kind of, when's the Lord going to start doing things? Just, just waiting on the Lord. Like we're at a bus stop, just, just waiting for the Lord to show up. And I think it would be better to interpret it as we are alert, we're awake, we're ready, and we're, does the Lord want me to go, do, is, is, is it ready, is it time? And, and we're waiting on the Lord in the sense of we're serving him. We are seeking his face. We're in prayer with him. We're looking into his word and we're anxiously seeking what he would have us to do rather than just sort of standing by passively and wondering if he's ever going to show up. So patience is indeed a virtue of scripture and a virtue of the spirit. And we are all called to wait on the Lord, not passively, but actively with the pages of scripture open with our prayer closets and engaged in, in full work there with the Spirit, that we might be ready and able when the Lord calls us to act. Let us pray.